Good morning, everybody. It's my great privilege to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Tachi Yamada. Dr. Yamada is, is currently Executive Vice President, Chief Medical and Scientific Officer at Takeda. Since joining Takeda in 2011, he's been leading the company's R&D efforts to improve health in both the developed and developing world. In his prior role before Takeda, as the president of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, he oversaw the foundation's over $9 billion of grant budget directed at addressing the health challenges of the developing world, including TB, HIV, malaria, and other infectious diseases, as well as malnutrition and maternal and child health. Before joining the Gates Foundation, he was the chairman, chairman for research and development and a member of the board of directors for GSK. Dr. Yamato was born in Japan and completed his education in the United States. He graduated from Stanford University with a Bachelor of Arts in History and obtained his Doctor of Medicine from the New York University School of Medicine. After completing his internal medicine training at Medical College of Virginia, he became an investigator in the United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. He then trained in gastroenterology at UCLA and assumed his first faculty position there. He later moved to University of Michigan, where he eventually became the chairperson of Department of Internal Medicine and Physician-in-Chief of the University of, University of Michigan Medical Center before joining GSK. Along the way, he worked as a venture capital investor, and he also worked as an editor of books. And in fact, he's the editor of the most oft-used reference textbook in gastroenterology called Textbook of Gastro Gastroenterology, <laughs> now in its fifth edition. An interesting personal fact about Tachi, he is, and we were talking about this with the chancellor right before um, just, just minutes ago, he's an avid and disciplined exerciser. Legend has it that while living in Michigan, he logged over 100,000 miles, running at least 10 miles a day. Legend also has it that in all of his world travels, no team, no team member has ever beaten him to the hotel gym in the morning. I've also heard that when on his elliptical, he can be found working out on the highest setting on the elliptical for the entire duration. True to his professional accomplishments to date, these personal facts are quite incredible, but not surprising. Dr. Yamada's roles and his significant accomplishments in these multiplicity of sectors, academia, industry, finance, and NGO, provide him with a unique perspective on the challenges of global health and the ways to address the issues that we experience a world where all these sectors are starting to converge more than ever before. The title of his talk today is Lessons from Global Health. Please join me in welcoming, extending a warm welcome to Dr. Tachi Yamada. Thank you, June. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I've been here often at UCSF uh, and I've always been impressed with the quality of the science in this organization and the commitment uh, to translate that science into meaningful health solutions. June gave a, a, a very uh, nice and perhaps undeserving introduction, but I just wanted to give you some sense of uh, where I am and how I got here. I was uh, an academic, like most of you in this room, uh, enjoying life as a uh, physician scientist with a laboratory um, with uh, trainees and as residents and fellows uh, and with some administrative responsibilities as a chairman of a department. And I got a call from a headhunter saying, would I be interested in joining the board of a pharmaceutical company? And I joined the pharmaceutical company uh, as a board member because I was sort of interested to see how business really worked, recognizing that uh, uh, academic medical centers are 
sort of aberrant businesses, uh, and I wanted to see how a real business worked. And um, after I'd been there for a couple of years on the board, they asked me if I joined the company. The idea of making a medicine that would have uh, uh, an impact on millions of people's lives was was really a compelling uh, proposition, and and so I, I left academia, joined industry uh, at full time, and first as a head of a of a business unit, then eventually as the chairman of research and development uh, of, a, of a large pharmaceutical company. Now, what happened to me there was something that, that was really uh, transformative for me. Shortly after the merger of Glaxo, Wellcome, and SmithKline Beecham, the, uh, the company that I was working for sued Nelson Mandela personally, and also the government of South Africa over the pricing of HIV medicines. Now, I, I think this is a, a very committed uh, general manager working in a country in South Africa trying to make his budget. And he was selling HIV medicines. And uh, he figured he had to make his budget, so he had to sue the government of South Africa to increase his prices. Of course, this incident gained worldwide notoriety and probably had as much to do with damaging the reputation of the pharmaceutical industry as any. And for me, working in a pharmaceutical company, I was shocked. Um, I, didn't, I didn't realize that we would do something like this. Nelson Mandela is perhaps the closest thing to a living saint, and we would sue him in a country where, at least in the black population, the prevalence of HIV was 25%. 25% prevalence. When you think about that, it's not too long before the whole population of, of blacks might disappear from a country. And at that time, HIV medicines were not so broadly prevalent. This was the days before the President's emergency plan for AIDS relief and the global funds for AIDS to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. There just wasn't any money around. And the, the cost of treating an HIV uh, patient with triple drug therapy, even in, with a concessionary price, was in the neighborhood of three to $4,000 a year. It's not possible for a country like South Africa to support the treatment of 25% of its black population at that rate. So I was shocked, and I didn't know quite what to do, but I was on the board of directors. I went to the board and said, you know, we can't, um, we can't be a company like this. We can't make medicines that save lives and then not allow people to access those medicines. Uh, so they asked what we should do as a company, um, and of course, it was obvious that we could reduce the price. But beyond that, I felt it was really important for the company to make a commitment to making medicines for people where we might not make profit, but where we could have huge medical impact. And so the, the board allowed me to set up a laboratory in uh, Tres Cantos, Spain, that focused solely on the making of medicines for malaria and tuberculosis. It was a, a great laboratory, and it was very exciting activity. Some of the best scientists in the company wanted to go work there, because it was a, very motivating that we would have such a commitment. And I'd ask these people to be entrepreneurial, that I could give them a certain budget to start, but that they should seek other ways to s extend their capabilities. So they, they were very entrepreneurial and established relationships with product development partnerships such as the Medicines for Malaria Venture and the Global Alliance for TB, which were like uh, small startup companies that were focused on specific areas of, uh, of uh, pharmaceutical discovery and development in malaria and TB. And they were largely funded by the Gates Foundation. So after a few years, I went to visit 
the Gates Foundation um, to discuss our collaborative programs. And I had the opportunity to meet with Bill and Melinda. And shortly after the meeting, basically, they called me up and said, you know, we'd like you to come and join the Gates Foundation. We think of ourselves as uh, not just a foundation, but also as an organization that is capable of making new medicines and vaccines for people who need them. And, and we'd like to have somebody like you come on board. It was a very compelling proposition for me. And so I left GlaxoSmithKline and joined the Gates Foundation. I, I promised to spend five years with them. And it was an exhilarating and exhausting five years. And I learned some very important lessons about how I would have conducted myself as an academic physician or as somebody in industry differently from having had the experience of working in the foundation and learning the lessons that I learned. Now, after those five years, I, I, uh, I wanted to live up to a promise I made to my father many years ago that when I left Japan that someday I'd go back and do something in Japan. So now I work with Takeda Pharmaceutical uh, Corporation. I'm delighted to be there. And what I have done in this opportunity to redo what I was doing in the farm industry by taking the lessons that I learned in global health and applying them to what I do today. Now, just a short background on the Gates Foundation. Some of you may or may not know about the foundation. It's, it's actually uh, a relatively new foundation. It, in its current form, it wasn't really established. It was, it was established really only 12 years ago. It's amazing because of the impact the foundation has had that it's only 12 years old. It has a corpus of around $70 billion, and it spends the 5% of that on three programs, the Global Health Program, uh, where I which I had the pleasure of leading a global development program, which was mostly focused on agriculture, and a U.S. program, which is mostly faced, uh, focused on uh, high school education. The Global Health Program uh, funded essentially two-thirds of the programs of the Gates Foundation. Now, Bill uh, and Melinda are science technology type people. And, and so they wanted the foundation to be focused on technology-based health solutions with real potential for impact in the developing world. They had traveled uh, in their, after their marriage to many corners of the world. And they'd seen, particularly in India, that children were dying from rotavirus diarrhea. They had no idea. They never heard of rotavirus. They'd never understood that children could die from diarrhea. And it shocked them, and, and they weren't quite sure what to do. But they did understand a lesson that they had observed from polio in the United States. In the 1930s and 1940s, there really wasn't an NIH as we know it. And there were, there were some very important private charities. And the most important private charity was the March of Dimes. The March of Dimes raised money primarily with the influence of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt for polio. And at that time, there was a great demand for treatment of polio survivors because many of them were very ill, had terrible uh, problems with uh, nerve deficits. Some of them, and a good number of them, uh, relegated to being on iron lungs uh, in medical wards uh, in hospitals throughout the United States. And so there was a lot of pressure on the March of Dimes to spend the money for treatment of these people. But 
the best wisdom of the people that were running the March of Dimes told them that they should actually spend the money on developing a solution that would prevent people from getting polio rather than spend the money on treating patients. So they invested the money on a polio vaccine. Now you know about the effects of the vaccine, first the Salk vaccine and then the Sabin vaccine. Today the vaccine's available uh, for an average price of around 12 cents per dose. And that vaccine has essentially eliminated polio from almost every country in the world with the exception of Nigeria, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And fewer than 1,000 cases of polio uh, have occurred in the past year. This is the kind of impact they wanted. So they really set us up in the foundation to make medicines and vaccines and then to deliver them for impact. I give you this as a background uh, to, to describe the lessons that I learned. The first and most important lesson I learned was a lesson that has to do with urgency. Now it's hard to believe that you would need a sense of urgency recognizing that now seven or eight billion children die each year unnecessarily from diseases that could be treated or prevented very easily. It's hard to believe because maybe the number is so staggering and so huge. But the lesson was brought home to me very early in my tenure at the Gates Foundation. Uh, a month after I joined, I took a trip to, to Africa with uh, Bill and Melinda, and then I went on my own to other parts of Africa, um, to primarily to Mozambique. And in, in the southern part of Mozambique, where we had a research program in malaria, um, I had a chance to visit a, a sub-district hospital in a village called Manhisa. And the sub-district hospital, hospital is kind of a loose term for a collection of Quonset huts and tents, um, such as it, it was. And when I went to the hospital, the first place I went was the uh, uh, intake area as I came into the hospital. I saw a mother and a child sitting there. Uh, the child was very sick. I could see that. Mother had this look of panic on her face. Um, and I thought, well, the child's going to be admitted. And we took a tour of the hospital, and some 30 or 40 minutes later, we went over to the uh, pediatric ward, where now the mother and child were there. The child was admitted. And the child had just deteriorated so rapidly between the time I saw him in the, in the intake area and the time he was on the ward, that he, he was breathing literally at 100 breaths per minute. It's very, very hard to breathe at that rate. He was dying there. The mom was just absolutely distraught and panicked. And you know, it occurred to me there that, first of all, that um, the child was dying, not because of malaria, which was the presumptive diagnosis, but because of malnutrition, because of repeated infections, because no doubt an inadequate immune system, because of neglect, because of exposure, because of poverty, because of all these things. And it was occurring 8 million times a year. It's unbelievable when you think about it, the sense of urgency that you get when you realize, oh, every day, every day you can actually save some of these lives by having a vaccine available sooner. Every day counts when you see that many children dying each year. And so I gained a sense of urgency that I never felt before. I worked in academic medical centers. I worked on the clinical services. I was a house officer and a fellow. I saw many patients die. Nothing gave me the same sense of urgency. 
Now this is really brought home when we were working with an organization called the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, Gavi. Gavi was a great organization. It was an invention of the Gates Foundation. It was established 12 years ago, and it provides subsidies for low-cost vaccines for the poorest countries in the world, for the children in the poorest countries in the world. This has been an incredibly successful program, and it's estimated that now that more than 10 million children's lives have been saved by this program. But about four years ago, we realized, after eight years of existence, that Gavi was in deep trouble. It was spending 300, it was spending a billion dollars a year and raising 300 million dollars a year in funding. Now it had a little bit of a reserve because of a sort of a bond program called the International Finance Facility for Immunizations, IFM, but that money was about to run out. It was mismanaged. And we were headed for a global disaster of unbelievable proportions. And the challenge of actually fixing this organization was so great. And this is now 2008. The financial crisis hit the world. The, the idea of raising more money for Gavi seemed preposterous. So what were we going to do? I, I remember we had a meeting with Bill. Gates and, and told him that there's a big problem here, that we needed to fix it, but it was going to be extremely hard to fix. There were multiple components to the problem. And, and Bill basically very calmly, sometimes he was not so calm, but, but on this occasion he is very calm, and he said, okay, give me a triage strategy. We said, well, a triage strategy? What are, you, what are you talking about? They said, now his voice starting to rise, several octaves. And he said, I, I mean by a triage strategy, tell me which babies you're going to allow to live and which babies you're going to allow to die. If we can't fix this problem, we have to play God and decide who's going to get the vaccine and who's not. And that instilled in us a sense of urgency that I don't think I've ever felt before. Having seen these mothers and these children, and knowing the impact of the vaccines, and then facing the prospect that we, because we'd started this program, that we'd created this hope, now we would have to choose who would live and die because of our inability to fix a problem. Well, a couple of people in, in this room that are key players in this, Jaime Sepulveda, who is the head of your global health program, was one of them. Rajiv Venkaya, who runs the Takeda's vaccine business, is another. We, the three of us, were faced with this problem. So I want to talk about some profiles and courage and, and, and conviction that led to the success that we were eventually able to achieve. The first is that the management of, of Gavi, this organization, was broken and we couldn't fix the organization until we actually changed management. But you understand, Gavi is like a UN organization. Its board consisted of 24 members who are comprised like Noah's Ark, one from each species on this board. And, and it is very, very difficult to take a board of 24 and take control of it. But we had an opportunity because the chairman of the executive committee of Gavi was retiring and a new one had to be put into place. Now, the management of the organization was bound and determined the Gates Foundation would have nothing to do with that position, but I thought it was really critical for us to achieve our aims. And Jaime, who was 
uh, running a very important program in the foundation, which was all about delivery of, uh, uh, of our solutions. He, he ran a group called Integrated Health Services Delivery. And I asked him to, to step down from that position and move to take over the executive committee of Gavi, which would be a full-time proposition, because that was the first step in which we had to fix this organization. And he said he would. And then there was an election. And during the election, which was being held in, in Vietnam, I got a call uh, from the group of the, from the foundation who were there saying, it's not going well. Jaime is not going to get elected. If we, get, if we persist on this, we're going to get egg all over our face. And the foundation will lose its control over the, this organization. So I spoke to Jaime, and I said, Jaime, are you willing to risk your reputation on this? Because if you are, I'm going to say, let's go ahead, and let's call the question. And Jaime, and Jaime had a lot to lose, really, because if he stood for election and lost, and he stood for a foundation which would have been portrayed as trying a, a sort of a, an unfriendly takeover, it would have been very unfortunate. But Jaime said, of course, of course, I'm willing to take this on. So we persisted. The election took place, and Jaime won. That's unbelievable. But Jaime, as they, many of you may know, is a diplomat of the highest order. And one by one, with each board member, over the course of the next six months, he gained the confidence of the board, had them understand the magnitude of the problem, and then ultimately supported what eventually became a change in management. That was step one. Step two, a very critical aspect of it, was the cost of the vaccines that Gavi was supporting. They were unsustainably high. Because of that, whatever resources Gavi had couldn't couldn't go as far as they might have gone. And a critical piece of this was the cost of the rotavirus vaccine. The only supplier for the rotavirus vaccine was GlaxoSmithKline. And GlaxoSmithKline was charging the about $7.50 for the course of treatment. And that was very expensive. And we had a target price of $2.50. The Gates Foundation's approach to rotavirus was, in the first instance, we get the, the big pharma companies to lower their prices. In the second instance, we would fund research in low-cost developing world manufacturer uh, companies to develop a lower-cost vaccine. And in the third instance, to invest in biotechnology, uh, emerging technologies, to ultimately create a sea change in the price. Of, of, uh, of the vaccine. So immediate term, we wanted to lower the 750 price to 250. Intermediate term, Indian companies with competitive vaccines would lower it to $1.50 or less. And then with new technology, hopefully under a dollar. That was the long-term plan. So with very extensive negotiation, very complex negotiation, Rajiv was able to lower the price from 750 to 250. But there was one condition, and it was a very, very difficult condition, which was that the pharmaceutical companies were bound through a, a, an agreement with the Pan American Health Organization that the Pan American Health Organization would get the lowest price of any price that they offered to anybody. Now, the Pan American Health Organization had two countries which are critical targets for the pharmaceutical industry in terms of their growth plans, Brazil and Mexico. So if they would lower their price of their vaccines to Brazil and Mexico so that they were paying the same price that African nations would pay, then it would be very, very difficult from their corporate financial strategy to do. 
So that meant we had to change the practices of the Pan American Health Organization. Now this is a very proud and old organization. It's older than the WHO. And this organization, through its hard-nosed bargaining, was able to create a low-priced vaccine uh, opportunity for every country in uh, South and Central America. And the health of South and Central America gre uh, greatly increased because of this plan. So to get them to give on this was an incredible challenge. We had numerous meetings. I can remember Bill not quite screaming, but very close to screaming and saying, why can't you get the Paho people to heal? Um, well, he doesn't understand how proud traditions can persist for a long, long time. But through persistence, hard work, tremendous diligence, Rajiv and his team was able to convince the Pan American Health Organization to back off. And that allowed the low price to move forward. And then finally, the third most important thing was raising the money. And it was going to be very hard. But we had two very important allies. One was the UK, <coughs> Department for International Development. And the other was the government of Norway. And what, what happened there was really nothing short of remarkable. Because the UK was lowering their budget, cutting almost 25% of their budget to almost every agency in the, in, in the country. This is very sim similar to the sequestration effort that's going on in the United States today, which we're all afraid of. Well, Great Britain, the United Kingdom, went through a sequestration process which cut 25% out of all the agencies, except for the National Health Service and the Department for International Development, the agency which is comparable to USAID and provides development assistance. But what they did was they did an analysis which was called value for money analysis. That is, return, in business terms, it's return on investment analysis. And their assessment was vaccines provided the greatest return on investment. So they were willing to triple their donations to the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations. We tripled our commitment. The Norway, government of Norway, because they had all this money from North Sea Oil, put a lot of it into development assistance, were a very important partner for us. And they doubled the amount of money they gave. And so there was a fundraising campaign that resulted in a stable source of funding for the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization at the rate of a billion dollars plus per year and a commitment for five years and beyond. So through the fundraising effort, we tripled the amount of money coming in. Through the effort to reduce pricing, we reduced the price of the core vaccine by a third. And most importantly, we were able to put in a new management into the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. A lot of sweat, a lot of tears. And it would not have been done without the greatest possible sense of urgency. Now when I think about what I used to do in an academic medical center, I did research. I love the research. I did. I had four NIH grants. I thought I was doing very well. But I never really had a sense of urgency about it. You know, it was about the next, the urgency was, can I get the grant written? Can I get the paper out? Not about, is it going to save lives? Is, it, is this going to go somewhere? Is it going to make a difference? And so when I think of urgency, you know, this Clinical Translational Science Institute, that is a vehicle for urgency in an academic medical center. This is the way it's possible to take the science and get that science to people who need it faster. Because every day counts. My mom had Alzheimer's disease. I know if I could have gotten a treatment to her, I would have done anything. And, and that's the way I approach life today in a pharmaceutical company. And I hope I can get that sense of urgency to the people who work with me 
in the company. We work on Alzheimer's disease. I remember what it was like when my mother was dying. Every day would have made a difference if I could have had some impact on her life before she died. It would have been the greatest and most satisfying thing I could have done. That sense of urgency, I think, is really important, not just in global health, but also in what we do every day if we're in the business of healthcare and all of us in this room are in some way or other connected to healthcare. The second lesson that I learned had to do with innovation. Now, innovation is a word that is often abused. Innovation is in almost every corporate logo. We aspire to be the innovators of the industry. We are, you know, our core value is innovation. But innovation means different things to different people. In the case of global health, we have great need for innovation. If you look at tuberculosis, the most commonly used diagnostic for tuberculosis is 100 years old. There is a vaccine for tuberculosis which is not very effective. That's 80 years old. And until last month, the last medicine that was made for TB and approved for use in that disorder was made 55 years ago. So where is the innovation? Millions of people die with this condition. Two billion people in the world have the condition in a latent form. There has been no innovation. There has been extremely little innovation. And, and it's because I think innovation has to be viewed in different stages. I think there is evolutionary innovation. And evolutionary innovation is generally what we're all about. That's what we do every day. We build on somebody else's science and we say, OK, well, here's some iteration of it. That moves science forward. That's very important. I would never take away the importance of evolutionary innovation. But then there's revolutionary innovation, which is innovation that provides new insight that you could never have thought of before, that changes the game completely. I worked on peptic ulcer disease, and I saw innovation. And innovation was great. We went from sippy diets to antacids, and antacids to H2 blockers, and H2 blockers to proton pump inhibitors. Now there are potassium competitive acid blockers. They all focus on acid secretion. And the fundamental belief is that peptic ulcer is caused by acid secretion. But what everybody conveniently forgot was that once you stopped taking the anti-secretory agent, the ulcer came back. And there were two scientists in Western Australia that said, no, it's a bacterium that causes peptic ulcer disease, stupid. And those people were vilified, literally. We hated them, we who worked on acid secretion, because they were getting in our way. But they won the Nobel Prize. And now you can cure peptic ulcer disease. And the way you cure it is with an antibiotic. Well, that's a paradigm shift. Not only that, gastric cancer is caused by Helicobacter pylori, the same bug. <coughs> and so if you can treat the infection, you can prevent gastric cancer. Well, <coughs> excuse me. So revolutionary innovation is what's needed. And why don't we have it? Because we're sissies. <laughs> we refuse to take risks. We are afraid. We always want to make safe bets. We create a system of peer review. And innovators have no peers. Therefore, innovators will never pass the test of peer review. We have to have an ecosystem that challenges dogma, that is willing to suspend disbelief, 
that is willing to take risks, that is willing to fail and fail often, so that eventually something, something creative might come through. This environment for revolutionary innovation has to be established consciously. It doesn't happen unless you do it. We set up a program called Grand Challenges Explorations at the Gates Foundation in which basically we said, we want your most creative ideas on how to deal with malaria. And we got unbelievable numbers of applications. We said we'd give you $100,000 with no pre preliminary data, and all we need is a two-page application. And the reason why we did that is because we knew that somebody, you know, a young scientist in China was going to have a hard time creating a 20-page NIH grant and have preliminary data and all of that. A two-page application with no preliminary data, but just a creative idea. And we had a review panel that consisted in this case, there were a dozen Nobel Prize winners on the review panel, and all they had to do was to give us one score, yes or no. And we allowed one yes that was certain to be funded and two silver yeses, which would allow them to be considered for funding. And all the rest of the applications that they got, they would throw in the waste bin because they weren't creative enough. And if you succeeded with this proposal after $100,000 in one or two years, then we were prepared if you came back to us and showed us evidence that this theory had legs, then you could get a million dollars. A million dollars. Well, we really had a very exciting and successful run of this. You know, in the case of malaria, we had applications that were, you know, some were really astounding. Of course, some were sort of uh, Nobel, Nobel Prize winners applying. Uh, Richard Axel applied with the idea of finding odorant receptors on mosquitoes that would help them recognize humans as food, and that he would create a new class of compounds which were not insecticides, uh, and there weren't repellents, they were called confusants. So they would actually confuse the mosquito into thinking that you weren't food when you really were. Well, that, that program moved forward. Actually, a major chemical company from Germany has taken it up and is moving forward with this, uh, this concept. We've had applications. One scientist found that, that actually a certain uh, high-frequency um, sound, uh, 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 a magnetic wave uh, frequency would cause vibration of the hemozoan pigment in the malaria parasites and then set up a process of uh, programmed cell death, apoptosis. Uh, and so his idea was to take a village, pass it through uh, airline security, you know, counter, and one passage, then all the malaria would be cleared, and well, we funded it. I don't know how, how that's come out, but actually, that's the kind of program we were willing to fund. There was uh, uh, one scientist, Johns Hopkins, a brilliant young guy, Rohel Dinglayson, where his idea was to immunize the mosquito as opposed to the human, because the mosquito is part of the life cycle of a malaria parasite. So actually, you would inoculate a human against a mosquito antigen. The antibody that was produced would be passively uh, transferred to the mosquito as it sucked the blood up. And this, passive, this would cause passive immunization of a, of a protein that was critical in the translocation of, of the parasite across the intestinal epithelium in its life cycle fantastic opportunity that's actually moving forward now into clinical development in the coming year. We've had some really crazy ones. One was a, 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 a scientist 
who was responsible for the Star Wars initiative in the United States uh, you know, back in the 1980s. Um, and his idea was that you would take uh, two telephone poles and electrical field between them. The electrical field could distinguish on the wing beat frequency of the mosquito, the difference between a mosquito or a fly or a moth or a bird. And then if a mosquito crossed, then it would be linked to a laser that would... <laughs> And, and, uh, and, and I saw the prototype in action. And there is nothing so satisfying as to see a mosquito pulverized by <laughs> if, you've bitten, if you've been bitten as often as I have. So, well, these are crazy ideas. But you know what? We funded them. Because we don't know what we don't know. And it's only out of semi-crazy ideas that I think the next step in global health will will happen. Now I think about the academic world in which you live, in which I live, the NIH and the way it works, and how peer review governs everything that we do, and how most of the grants that get funded, half of the work's already done before the grant is submitted, and how truly novel ideas are nearly impossible to fund. We have to change. If we're going to make really revolutionary changes in our understanding of Alzheimer's disease or schizophrenia or, or many forms of cancer. We have to think about revolutionary innovation and how we go about that. And in the pharmaceutical industry, notoriously conservative industry, how do we create an environment that will allow revolutionary innovation to come forward? Progress in healthcare will not happen without revolutionary innovation to complement the very important process of evolutionary innovation. A third lesson I learned had to do with measurement. Now, if you work for a Gates Foundation and you're giving away three, four billion dollars a year, you're assuming you're doing good things. Because you're doing things that are qualitatively good. Are you actually doing things that are quantitatively good? How do you measure that? I worked for a CEO uh, at one time, Smith Klein Beecham, Jan Leslie. Jan Leslie was one of the top tennis players ever to come out of, out of Denmark. He was uh, in, in the Wimbledon. He was in the uh, semifinals at the US Open. He always used to say, if you're not keeping score, you are just practicing. And in a way, I think about what he said. And, and, and this is one of the biggest challenges at the foundation. How do we keep score? How do we know that we've had an impact? So we invested a lot in, in organizations like uh, the International uh, 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 initiative for impact evaluation. We invested in the Health Metrics Network. We invested in the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. We really wanted to know uh, what impact we were having. Not just that we ran a program or that we successfully uh, implemented X, Y, or Z. The real question is, did we save lives? Did we have an impact? Well, when I think about the pharmaceutical industry, that's what we're being asked to do today. It's not enough that you have a treatment that is safe and effective. We have to have a treatment that is safe, effective, and has impact. Otherwise, we might get regulatory approval, but we're not likely to get pricing. Because society is only willing to pay for what they see is the impact for what they're paying. It's obvious. Take one step back and look at the NIH. I think it's going to come to the NIH too. The nation is putting forward $33 billion a year in a research enterprise. What is the impact of this on our nation's health? That's the question that's being asked. 
And I think we have to think about this when we do our work. Is it enough to publish a paper in Science or Nature of the New England Journal of Medicine? Is it enough to have $3 million in NIH grants? Is it enough to be the muckety-muck professor of University of California, San Francisco? Is it enough if what we're doing has no impact on society? And I think that really begs the question of what it means to have measurement applied to what we do. It's critically important. And I know that I think of impact very differently now working in a pharmaceutical company than I ever did before. The last concept, and perhaps one of the most important ones, is the concept of partnership. There's an old African adage that says, if you want to travel fast, walk alone. If you want to travel far, walk together. The concept of partnership is critical if you want to go a long ways. Now, one of the big problems in global health is there's this lack of partnership, amazingly enough, between the agencies that are involved in the area. So one of the first things that we tried to do was to set up a, a dialogue, a collaboration. We set up an organization called H8, which consisted of the WHO, uh, uh, UNICEF, uh, UNAIDS, uh, UNFPA, World Bank, Gavi, Global Fund, Gates Foundation, to try to communicate, to try to organize what we were doing, and to make sure that what we were doing was complementary and synergistic. One of the great stories of my time when I was at the Gates Foundation was when I was in Ouagadougou uh, in Burkina Faso in 2010. And, and this was the culmination of a seven-year effort to address a major problem. The health ministers of the Central African nations came to the WHO and said, meningitis A is a terrible problem. It's killing, it's maiming, it's causing huge fear and economic chaos. What can you do to help us? The WHO reached out to the Gates Foundation and said, can you help us in this? We said, yes, we'd like to. We committed $70 million to the creation of a meningitis A vaccine. In order to do this, there was intellectual property held by a small Dutch company who we convinced to give up that intellectual property for this effort. There was also, interesting, interestingly enough, intellectual property held in the FDA, and they were willing to give that up. And then we partnered with an NGO, PATH, uh, an organization that, that does many programs in, in the developing world, to be the project manager for this. And PATH worked with a private, for-profit Indian vaccine company, the Serum Institute of India, to create a vaccine that would work first time, almost 100% effective, at a cost less than 50 cents. Seven years and $70 million later, I was in Ouagadougou to give some of the first doses of this vaccine. I vaccinated a seven-year-old girl had a big smile on her face. As I vaccinated her, I was really worried because I had never given a vaccination in my life. <laughs> but she still had a smile on her face after I jabbed her. And I thought that was the most enriching experience of my life, that, that, that this partnership was able to produce something that was going to save this girl's life and many other lives like hers. This is only possible because of partnership. Now I think about academic institutions where partnership is rarely rewarded. If you're not the first author or the last author in a paper, you might as well have not written it. Because 
That's the way promotion and review panels look at it. If you're not the principal investigator at NIH grant, you can't even count it as something that you, you've had. So if you're a really good partner, you get no credit, or very little anyway. We have to create an environment that's different. Frankly, nothing will be done in universities that will really transform healthcare unless we change the idea of giving credit for partnerships. Partnerships get things done. Without partnerships, it's almost impossible. The same is true of industry. I remember a few years ago, there was one very prominent American pharmaceutical company who took pride in the fact that they never partnered with anybody. Everything that they did came from inside their four walls. Well, you know what happens to companies like that. In today's world, they don't survive. There has to be partnership to be successful in anything. Well, Bill Gates said in an address he gave at graduation at Harvard University, something that I thought was very profound. He said that humanity's greatest advances are not in its discoveries, but in how those discoveries are applied to reduce inequity. There is no question about this. There's no bigger test for the world today than the crisis of global health. You know, I've, I've witnessed it for myself. The challenge of dealing with death and misery is stark and real. It's different from anything I ever dealt with in academic medicine or in the pharmaceutical industry. It's something that all of us have to address in whatever way we can. But I think we can address this issue of health care, not just in the developing world, but also in the developed world. But only if we take these lessons about urgency, innovation, partnership, and measurement, and apply them religiously in what we do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that really thoughtful and thought-provoking talk. We'll have a few minutes for some Q&A, so if you have some questions, please step right up and, and ask. Hi, good morning. I'm Simona Zompi. I'm the executive director of the Center for Global Public Health at UC Berkeley. And uh, it was a very great talk. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, um, you just touched upon inequity, and I'm very interested in this, and how you, know, you would go forward, and what would be the idea and the challenges to try to break this inequity at the level of uh, different nations, but also at the more global health level, because this is a little bit beyond just the pure innovation of the medicine itself. Yeah. Um... Of course, it's a very challenging issue of inequity. The, uh, from a healthcare perspective, I believe the biggest and most important tool to address inequity is vaccines. Vaccines are inexpensive, by and large. And the idea that you can give a treat, measles vaccine, as you know, costs a nickel, five cents, provide lifelong protection against measles. There is no other health intervention that, can, that is an equalizer, that is a game changer. If nickel is, is affordable in the poorest nation in the world, as it is in the richest nation in the world. So I do believe one of the critical initiatives, uh, critical priorities of the foundation was vaccines. And, and, and frankly, one of the first things I did at Takeda was to take our re relatively small vaccine business unit and create very substantial ambitions for it and recruited Rajiv from the Gates Foundation to run it. Because I think a pharmaceutical company has to address these kinds of issues. You know, the idea that you would go into India and say, we want our intellectual property to hold in India 
and we want to extract a lot of money out of India. You know, everybody's saying India could be the fifth largest market in the world in 2005 and 2020. That's a whole lot of baloney because India has two million children dying each year. If India can't address that problem, they're not going to allow a pharmaceutical company to take a lot of money out of the country. So unless you can be part of the solution for the country's problem, you cannot be successful uh, commercially in the country. I think the same is true in China. You know, there's, they're expecting China to be the number two uh, market in the world by 2020. I don't think so. I think they're going to say, come and help our problems here. We still have a lot of people with lots of problems. Unless you can help us solve these problems, we're not going to let you take the cream out of the country and take all this money out. So, I think inequity has a certain demand that will force commercial entities to address those problems if they're going to be successful. From the standpoint of science and technology, think about cost. Solutions that are more costly have limited viability in the future. Right now, the US, 18% of GDP, 19% of GDP going to health care. There's, there's a limit to this. How many, there's a, there's a treatment that's coming out now for short bowel syndrome, um, teduglutide, $275,000 a year they want to charge for this medicine. Well, you know, that's what you need to be successful commercially. But that's not going to be allowable. And that kind of price is the antithesis of equity. How many people can afford it? How many countries can afford it? So we have to think about cost. We have to think about innovation in cost as well as innovation in science. And frankly, the two can go quite well hand in hand. Absolutely great science can reduce cost, I believe as opposed to increased costs. And very inspiring thoughts about revolutionary research. Can you see ways of supporting revolutionary research within academia in your new role in Takeda? Well, I, I know in Takeda we, we have this, uh, uh, we have a program which invites applications from young scientists in our discovery organization um, to submit their outlandish ideas which their bosses would not allow them to pursue. And then we review it. Last year, last year there were 75, of which we funded 50. Each one of them got $50,000. And, and, and the scientists were freed up to pursue that program. And we'll assess in a year. But the, from the year before, there were about 30 that were funded. Of the 30, only about five were killed. 25 were ended, up, ended up getting taken up as programs. In, the, in, in, in one, of the, one or another of the therapeutic areas. Um, I'm Bob Owen. I'm involved in GI and infectious diseases. When I was working on the smallpox eradication program in Nigeria, I was surprised when we were uh, trying to save the babies that the people there said, no, it's more important to save the 20 and 30 year olds because they're already culturally invested in it. It only takes uh, two years to replace a one year old. And um, so thinking that you, when you were talking about, you know, uh, saving lives of small children at a time when we're facing global warming and have probably too many children and too many people, whether the emphasis should be on improving the quality of life on those who are already here rather than for the small and e easily replaceable children. Well, I think that's a... Um you know, there's a trade-off, and, and that's an interesting perspective, but I believe that there are things that can be done to improve the lives of children. They're born, whether you like them or not. And the idea that we're just going to relegate them to death is not a really good approach to, I think, a better world. The question is, A, can we have reasonable family planning? Uh, and, by the way, improve child survival uh, is very, very dependent upon the uh, fertility rate in a country. As you lower fertility rate, uh, child survival improves. And in fact, the population of a country actually uh, remains 
relatively uh, stable, if you will, uh, as opposed it, the concept was if you allow children to live longer, then the population of the country would explode, but that's really not, not been the case. Well, we have a lot of problems in this world. I mean, you could say, what are the biggest problems? They have to do with climate change, they have to do with global peace and security, and they have to do with global health. And I don't think it's a trade-off one or the other. We have enough in this world to focus on all three, and we should. And I don't think we should say, wow, there's no sense in thinking about global health if we're all going to die with global warming. You know, we, have, we have to understand the big challenges of the world has, and we have to face them each as best we can. Quick one. How do we take lessons that you've learned and, and apply them to inequities here in the United States, in our own backyard? I think these same principles apply. I think we have to have a sense of urgency. You know, in, in, for, for African-American males in Washington, D.C., the, the life expectancy approaches some of the life expectancies in sub-Saharan African countries, and the prevalence of AIDS is over 20%. So we do have these same problems in this country. The, the challenge is that we don't have the will to take the two plus trillion dollars we spend on health care and distribute it so that we can address some of these problems. Our problem is not resources. Our problem is will. And I think that's... It depends on all of us, really. Government is about all of us and what, what demands we make of government. And I think we've made inefficient, insufficient demands on government, we the voters. We're short on time, but maybe one more question, and then we can um, During, when I was at Gavi, one of the live debates was how much to invest actually in the vaccines and how much in the health systems to deliver them to that hospital or clinic in southern Mozambique. I wonder whether your own thinking has evolved over time about innovation and the amount of investment that's needed to actually get the products and services to those at the end of the road. So I believe that, that <clears throat> the primary source of funds for health service strengthening, health system strengthening, is actually bilateral donations. That's what nations do. You know, Germany, France, Italy, all these countries put their money on health system strengthening. They do not put their money in Gavi. My feeling is that the amount that goes into Gavi is so small. It's, it's now $1 billion a year until recently $300 million a year. That, that money should not be diverted to areas where we expect other countries to make significant investments. So that's one of the you know, issues that, that the Gates Foundation is still um, discussing with Gavi on a regular basis, because nobody else is going to pay for the vaccines. Uh, and, and, and Gavi, if you don't have Gavi, there is no money for vaccines. So how do we save that money for vaccines and then work with the other donors to address the health system strengthening that's required for these vaccines to be delivered? Yeah, thank you very much.